All right, blessings again. How are you all doing this evening um, on the ending of this first day coming into the second day of the week? I hope everybody listening right now is doing well. Your hearts are encouraged. Um, when you get a second, give me an audio check, please. I got some static on this end. All right, thank you, Sister Brittany. Appreciate it. Bless you, Brother Vernon, Brother Josh. Hallelujah. Bless you all coming into the room, listening by phone. Hope you had a beautiful first day, and I hope you're still chewing on the, the uh, message from yesterday, the um, word about submission, vital in this time, especially as the days are um, getting to the point where there's going to be more um, unrest and greater level of selfishness, and um, everything's going to get worse. Just put it that way. All right, bless you, Brother Vernon. Thank you for that. But, uh, yeah, again, I uh, appreciate you all joining me tonight on this edition of Blog Talk Radio. For those who will be listening in the video later, this is Elder Douglas Becker and doing the Brothers segment tonight. All right, tonight we're going to be talking about, this is kind of be a part one and part two type of study. And tonight we're going to be talking about vows and then in another study we're going to be talking about oaths. And I decided to break them down because there's a lot of topic. Um, a lot of material on each topic to cover, and it's just um, I like to keep things to at least you know an hour, not drag it out much longer than that because it, you know uh, you like to have the saints be able to digest as much as they can and not drag it out too long. You know people get tired, so anyway, but yeah, part one we're going to talk about vows, and um, I had really no idea, no inclination that I would be going this way, but. I had a couple incidences during the Feast of Tabernacles where uh, vows came to my attention. I was like, okay, this is strange because that's one thing that we never hear about, vows or oaths, or it's never really spoken about at all, but it is part of our culture. So we're going to study vows tonight and the importance of them and the implications behind them. And my hope is that the study is clear enough and concise enough that um, you can actually grasp and a lot of what spoken tonight you can retain. So, and brother Josh, man, I just found out not too long ago you're actually the one that posts the scriptures and stuff now. So, appreciate it, brother Josh. I truly do. Um, I'm a little bit slow behind the curve sometimes on stuff, but appreciate your labors. But with that, we're going to get started so we can keep this to about an hour. But anyway, again, tonight it's going to be about vows. All right, this is going to be a two-part study, y'all willing, about vows and then oaths. There is differences between the two, as we will show based on the uses of vows and oaths according to what we have written in our word. There is differences in the Hebrew definitions behind them, thus making them their, their meanings different, their implications different. There's differences in the legitimacy of them, but regardless, if it's a vow or oath, they both carry the penalty of sin for failure to perform that what was vowed or spoken as an oath. Now, vows are a very are very much a part of our heritage. They're very much a part of our Israelite culture, and they are a very real and serious part of the old past. Our people didn't take vows lightly. They understood how much Yahweh demanded a performance of vows once committed to him and in his name. Vows were taken very seriously because Yah took them very seriously. All right, what other differences in a vow and an oath and to swear to an oath? And that's thing we'll find out in part two about the oath. There are different Hebrew words and meanings behind oath and vows, so they logically don't represent the same implications. In Israelite culture, a vow, a, you vow a vow, and we swear an oath. We don't vow, or we don't swear a vow, and we don't vow an oath. So there's particular wording, and there's reasons behind the way things are um, done, and the way that the definitions behind them dictate why they're done that way. All vows are made directly to Yahweh, and that's Psalm 60, uh, 76, 11, and there's going to be other places where we're going to prove that. They're just to Yahweh. Yahweh requires that all vows be fulfilled, that one pay one's vows. Many vows incorporate afflictions of the soul, 
as a commitment to humble oneself before Yahweh. Those vows may involve fasting from certain things, may involve greater role of servitude amongst the brothers, a plethora of things. They may involve vows of celibacy or singleness. We must be very mindful and very careful when we commit to making a vow to the Most High. Many vows are committed in the spur of the moment, during times of duress and trouble, and no thought is given to the importance of keeping them. Some vows are also made in bitterness of one's soul when one is grieved and sorrowful about something in their life. Vows should never be considered or construed as a sort of barter and trade and a give and get with Yahweh. As Yahweh hears the petition of the one speaking the vow, but he does not have to answer to one's request. What of vows made prior to conversion? Are they still valid and require fulfillment? What of vows and oaths made in ignorance? Okay, that was notes that I should have taken out, but I didn't, so I might even touch on that. All right, this is of all my looking into this and getting a better understanding. I, I kind of defined it for myself um, what a vow is. All right, a vow is a petition, it's a pledge, it's a commitment to a specified thing. It's a solemn promise to commit oneself to an act, service, or condition. A vow is made directly to Yahweh and can be vowed before witnesses or without witnesses present. A vow before Yahweh can be for a specific time frame only or can be for a lifetime. Vows can be singular promises, meaning they are declarations to Yahweh and in his name that one will perform said vow as a show of dedication and, per, and promise expecting nothing in return. Then there are the vows which are enter, entered into as petitions where the one um, speaking the vow makes a vow with the hope of something in return, such as Hannah and her son Samuel, which we're going to talk about, or Japhet and his daughter. You remember that in the book of Judges. A vow before Yahweh cannot be broken, and to do so is sin against Yahweh, in, in only a few instances can vows be disannulled. Vows are taken very serious before Yahweh and can carry generational implications. And just to let you know right off the bat, we're not going to be talking about the Nazarite vow because it's impossible to conclude a Nazarite vow in the day and age that we live in. Um, and that's a fact. In fact, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about um, presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. We're supposed to be consecrated in this life, so, so there's no necessity to swear a Nazarite vow. So, excuse me, vow a Nazarite vow. Help me, help me, Jesus. And then, of course, First Thessalonians 5 is, is talking about your, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. So, and then the other reason you can't complete a Nazarite vow because you're not going to cut your hair off and you're not going to go present it to the priest where he's going to burn it on the altar, of course, because that all the ceremonial stuff is... Um, something that Yahshua did away with um, for us. So anyway, and I won't be talking about um, the ceremonial vows as described in Leviticus and other because, again, the necessity isn't really there, the need, um, because it had to do with vows. Vows, people vowed to give certain offerings and do certain fulfillments during the course of, of um, sacrifices and providing those things for sacrifices over a certain time period, and of course, because we don't do the ceremonial part, no reason to go into it. But they were part of our culture, and a very significant part, and very serious part. Most of this tonight is going to be in Numbers chapter 30. In fact, the, uh, a good part of it, uh, at least two-thirds of it, because that chapter in itself covers uh, the deepest anywhere in the Word, um, the implication of vows um, and... Um, what it has to do with women in vows and men in vows and everything. So we're going to start there. So Josh, Numbers chapter 30, it's going to be uh, verses 1, start at the first verse, and it's going to go to um, two seconds here. Verse 15. So Numbers chapter 30, verses 1 through 15. All righty, and Moshe spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, and I, I usually take all my stuff out of the King James, because most people are familiar with that, saying, this is the thing which Yahweh hath commanded. So 
uh, Moses is gathering the heads of the tribes, and he's going to relate this message to the thing that Yahweh hath commanded him to tell the heads of the tribes so they can tell the people that they're in rulership over, you know, each one of their prospective tribes. He goes on verse 2, If a man vow a vow unto Yahweh, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. So right off the gate, Yahweh is going to break it down and tell you the importance and tell you that this is something that you're not going to break your word when you get in so the people know up front that this is how serious and you're going to do everything that proceeds out of your mouth. Now, this particular verse is directed at males, not generically men, but as in males, right? You can find out the next verse, verse 3, is for the women, starts the women. But when a man vows a vow and swears an oath to bind his soul, and these are two separate things. These are not one and the same thing. They are two separate things, and I'm going to show you something here a little bit later. I think the language is a little bit messed up, but these are two separate things because a man vow a vow or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond. He sh in either case, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. All right, the word vow, as it is in the Hebrew, is the um, Strong's, no, this, yeah, this is a Strong's uh, 5088, and it's Nadar, Nadir, sorry, Nadir, okay? This is Nadir. And it's simply, it's from 5087, and it is a promise to Yahweh, also concretely a thing promised. It's something concrete, something that is not abstract, it's something concrete that you speak out of your mouth. Okay, so it comes from the, the uh, uh, again in the Strong's, the 5087, which is um, Nadar, okay, 5088 is Nidar, Nadir, and 5087 is Nadar, and it's important that we understand the difference in the two. And uh, Nadar, 5087, also means to promise positively to give something to Yahweh, to make a vow. Okay, the word Nadar, 5087, the first one, the second one we read, is a verb. It's the action, as when you vow a vow. Nadir, 5088, is the noun. So what we have is the action, Nadar, speaking. When you speak, that's the action of the intended promise or the neither or the thing, such as I promise, I'm just giving an example, such as I promise to never drink again if you deliver me from jail. You know, that's one of these things people do when they get drunk, get caught, and get desperate, right? But that was just a, a quick example. The spoken words being the action verb and the promise, which is the thing, being the noun. I hope I made that clear. All right, and also in Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, as we just read, the word break. So we have um, to vow, vow, to swear an oath, to bind his soul with a bond. He shall not break his word. Talking about men. And to break means to profane, defile, to desecrate, to violate the honor of, dishonor. So you actually what you're doing when you break the vow is you're dishonoring the Most High. You're dishonoring the one that you vowed the vow to, that you spoke the vow that you wanted to perform and that you promised to do. So it's a defilement. It's profane to Yahweh. It's a desecration of His law and of His commandment. It's to violate the honor of, the dishonor. It's to treat as calming, like poo-poo. There's just no substance to it, right? Just speaking it off the top of your head. So he actually talks about not defiling your vow or your oath that you swore. And that's the, no, oh man, that, that's the, sorry, that's the Hebrew 2490, but this is in the Brown Driver Briggs. I'm getting ahead of myself. So that's the definition in the Brown Driver Briggs um, 2490, the word break in the Hebrew is chalal. Again, it means not to profane, defile, or desecrate. Sorry, I get a little ahead of myself. Or to wound. It's it's pretty long, but um, I just picked out some of the ones that um, really stood out as far as what the word break really implies. Okay, Josh put it up there. It's pretty long in the chat room. Those of you can see it, but you can see it's got... But, Again, it goes back to profaning, defiling, polluting, desecrating. Um, um, 
that which you intended to do and, and not to break. All right, chapter 3, so, or chapter three, verse 3. So we just talked about a man. Now he's got no, once he enters into a vow or he swears an oath, he has to complete it. There is no out for him. So when he enters in, he has to complete it. That's, there's, there's no stipulation at all. You're going to put yourself into it. You're going to commit to it. You're going to promise it. You must keep it or it's sin. It's sin against the Most High. It's defilement. It's profanity against him. But verse 3, if a woman, now we're talking about a woman. We just talked about a man. If a woman also vow, vow unto Yahweh, and bind herself with a bond, being in her father's house, in her youth. So we're getting some distinction here. Now we're talking about a woman. We just talked about a man, but we're talking about a woman. And even going farther than that, we're talking about the daughter, still in her father's house, in her youth. And we're going to find out what is um, going to happen in this instance when you're under the authority, a daughter's under the authority of her father. And for some reason, I caught this right away. I don't know why, um, that in verse 2 they said, if a man bow, bow, bow unto Yahweh, or bind, or swear an oath, but in verse 3 they decided not to do that, but you can find out later that it's still the same as the or, that vow, vow, or swear an oath. But why they change the language here, I don't know. So again, if a woman also vow, vow unto Yahweh and bind herself to a bond, being in her father's house in their youth, so there is distinction just so people pay attention to the direction that Yah is commanding Moses to tell the, the, the heads of the tribes. And her father hear her vow, and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul to stand. Verse 5, But if her father disallow her in the day that he hear it, not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. Here they use the word or now. And Yahweh shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. We can establish by the wording of these commands that the woman, the daughter, the maiden in this case, can vow, vow without consoling with her father first. Now I'm going to prove that to you. It seems out of character and not the correct protocol, but we're going to read by Numbers 30. That actually is the case, whether people agree with it or not. That's what the wording is telling us. So we can establish by the wording of these commands that the woman, the daughter, maiden in this case, can vow a vow without consoling with her father first. For if she was to console with her father first, and he was not agreeable with her intended vow, then he could, as the place of the father, deny her request. But this isn't the case as we find that Yahweh will forgive her, that also being after the fact. So what I'm trying to say that there's no reason to put that clause in there that if he if he disallows it in the days he hears it, that it's not going to be sin to her. Because if he heard it, if he cons she consoled him, her father right at the very beginning when she had an idea she wanted to vow this, then he would have said no on the spot, and there was no reason even to mention the sin factor about it, right? The only thing that would have been mentioned is if she did vow, vow, she would have had to continue with it, and that would have been the end of the story. So that in itself proves, as we're going to find out with the, with the wife to her husband, the same protocol, that they didn't have to go and speak this to the father first. They actually to do it, and then the day that he hears, that's the day he has to make the decision. And when it says, and we're going to read that several times in Numbers 3, that the, the time that he heareth, that's the time that uh, the father in this case, and then when we read down the husband, that's the time when they're made aware of it. Not so much as they, they could hear it physically, verbally from somebody else amongst the tribe. Um, the daughter may go ahead and reveal it after the fact. Who knows? Um, they just may see something that's out of character, out of difference, something that they just get something suspicious about. And they may question the daughter. And that day they they come to the awareness that she entered into this vow. And at that, that time, if they're not satisfied with it, that's the time that they have to break it, as we're going to talk about a little bit more. The hearing of the vow of which these verses speak of are the vows that are brought to the attention of the father at some point after the daughter has vowed. Again, I'm just reading my notes. And when those vows are made known to the Father, he must decide that very day. If he will let them ride or he will disannul them, 
And if he disannuls them, it will be at this point that Yah will forgive the daughter of her vows and loose her from her vow, and there will be no sin. All right, now we're going on to Numbers uh, verse chapter 3, verse 6, continuing on. And this goes into the uh, a woman being a married woman under the authority and covering of her husband. And if she, meaning the woman, had it all in husband, when she vowed or uttered out of her lips, where was she bound her soul, verse 7, and her husband heard it, and he held his peace at her in the day that he heard it, then her vows shall stand and her bonds, where was she bound her soul, shall stand. Again, as the same mandate on the father of the daughter that vowed, so will it be to the husband of the wife that vows, that on the day it comes to the knowledge or his awareness of her vow, meaning the wife in this case, he must act or hold his peace and allow, or allow the vow to stand. And something you're going to find out over and over and over again is that vows are only binding when they're spoken. There's nowhere within the context of the entire word where you can write a vow and present it to the Most High. It has to be spoken to be binding. Now you can speak it and then write it, so you have the you have the exact um, wording of what you vowed, which would be actually a wise thing to do, so it wouldn't slip. So you continue to go back and look at it, but it has to, a core lining up of the word has to be spoken. It has to be other, out of your mouth, confessed by your mouth, spoken out of your mouth, because it's coming from the heart, and that's the only thing that's going to make it binding. And um, God will ha he, that's how he's going to hear you. Okay, Numbers uh, 30, verse 8. But if her husband disallowed her on the day that he heard it, then he shall make her vow what she vowed, and that which she uttered with her lips, where was she bound her soul of none effect, and Yahweh shall forgive her. Declarations such as vows, oaths, promises must be verbally submitted to Yahweh before Yah and before men in some cases. And when I say that, because I'm not going to cover that, I'm talking about the ceremonial vows, right? When men vowed a vow in the ceremonial part where they, they, they vowed to bring offerings and, you know, whatever supply, whatever other needs um, directly for the ceremonies and the rites, um, they, they vowed before men. So there is, this is a case where there's witnesses that heard this. And we're going to find out in part two that when you swear an oath, there must be witnesses involved. It's not just a declaration directly made toward Yahweh. It's made amongst men to men. But that's going to be the second part. Yahweh willing in five weeks. Um, but, okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> there is no other lawful binding of vows, oaths, and promises, such as an example like I just talked about a little bit. Okay, so now we've talked about the daughter to her father. We've talked about the uh, wife to her husband, and the the, the uh, implications are the same. The, the pattern is the same. The layout is the same. Um, once the husband comes to the knowledge or the father comes to the knowledge of the vow, this is, this, most of this chapter, when it comes to vows, is talking about on the part of the women. We only have verse 2 that covers the men, and they're basically... Hey, once they enter into it, that's it. That's the end of the story. There is no disannulment for it. If you walk away from it, it's sin before the Most High. And he doesn't take it lightly. But with the women, they have a way out. They have, they have the ability to get it disannulled. And um, because that, they're being in the lesser authority is all I can, um, you know, the lesser role. So, but every vow, so now we're going to go on to verse 9. But every vow of a widow and of her that is divorced, these are both women that are not under a covering. Before, the other women were under the authority of a father or husband. Now you're talking a, a totally different category here now. Wherewith they have bound their soul shall stand against her, whether she be a widow or divorced. So it, it is, whatever they've done, outside the authority or from under authority, they're, they're, all of a sudden they find themselves in the same category as the men do in verse 2 because there is nobody in that state when they're widowed or divorced to disannul that, according to what we're reading here in Numbers 30. It's only when they're directly under the authority of a, of a male, either in the, in the case of father covering or a husband covering. I hope I'm making sense. 
So again, but every vow of a widow, and of her that is divorced, wherewith they have bound their soul, shall stand against her. And as we continue here in the next five verses, we're going to find out that we're going to backtrack to the time when they were married, before the, the, the widow's husband was deceased and before the wife was given a bill of divorce. So, uh, for, uh, verse 10, And if she, meaning either the widow or one that was divorced, had vowed in her husband's house or bound her soul by a bond with an oath. Now here we make a distinction between the two. Remember I said in verse 3 earlier that if they seem to mold together, but here again, as in verse 9 or verse 10, it's making a distinction, it's either a vow or bound her soul by an oath, by swearing an oath. So they are two different things. That's important to understand because it's who they're directed at in two. And I'll just let you in on this. Nowhere does it say anywhere that a vow carries a curse if it's broken, but it does with an oath, which is pretty amazing to me. All right. Commitments made by the widow or divorcee while she's still married are validated or voided by the say-so of her deceased or former husband. So what they're saying is that in the time prior to them becoming a widow or divorced when they were married, they were under the same stipulation, and we will find out why that this had to be written. Because when I first read it, it's like, well, why even say it? Because if they're on their own and the husband's dead or she's divorced, um, you know, what's the reason? But it makes it clear as we get towards the, the end of the, the speaking about the vows as to why that uh, Yahweh had to have Moshe also put this down for, the, for Israel. Verse 11, And her husband heard it, meaning... The husband that might have been is now deceased, or the husband that was, uh, you know, the, the husband for he was she was given a bill of divorce, and he held his peace at her and disallowed her not. Then all her vows shall stand, and every bond where was she bound her soul shall stand. If you're following me, so the implication is is the same as the married woman that we talked about in verses two through or yeah, four through eight, but now we're talking about widows and those that are divorced and what happened prior. And again, my note, and because the deceased or former husband held his peace during the time that that, that woman was with either you know, that husband or the, uh, the, the now deceased husband or the former husband, and that time he held his peace, she's still obligated now, even though she's no longer under that covering, to still perform her vow. That's where this is all getting to. That's why it's important that they had to write that. So again, even though she entered into a vow under a covering and the husband, at the time he heard it, while he was either alive or still uh, joined with this woman, and he did not disallow it at that time it came to his knowledge, then she still has to carry that vow she vowed, even though the fact she is no longer under their authority or the husband's dead, right? Verse 12, but if her husband hath utterly made them void on the day he heard them, then whatsoever proceedeth out of her lips concerning her vows or concerning the bond of her soul shall not stand. Her husband, meaning the deceased or former husband, has made them void, and Yahweh shall forgive her. That's during the time when they had the ability to do that. But this is the verse that kind of threw me off because what's the sense? Why even bring it up again? I mean, honestly... If it was voided while the widow was still under her husband before he died, or the, the divorced woman was still with that husband before he divorced, or why bring this up if they had already made him void in that day? Because they were void now, even in her present form as a widow or a divorcee. But there's a reason for this, right? And this is what I think it is. Again, my notes. Honestly, this verse is somewhat peculiar to me in that there seems to have not been need to have said as any voided vow would no longer be a concern or issue after the fact. But I believe this verse was necessary in order to prevent a woman upon the death of her husband or divorcement from the former husband of attempting to enter back into a vow after it had already been blocked, thereby nullifying it for the life of the widow or divorcee. 
if that makes sense. So I believe that's the real particular reason like that. So she can't say, well, he 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 cut me off when, when I was under his authority, and now that I'm free from that for whatever reason, I'm going to go ahead and do that again, and there's nobody to cut me off. There's a reason he didn't feel up to it when she was under his authority. And Yah put the stipulation in there that the woman can't um, go ahead and revow this vow without the fact that nobody ever being able to disannul it because, again, the authority isn't there to do it, if that's making sense. And that's very important to understand. Very important to understand. All right, verse 13. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict the soul, her husband may establish it or her husband may make it void. And I believe now we're flipping back into um, a woman that is presently married and not widowed or divorced. The whole of Numbers 30 is not just about vows pertaining to afflicting one's soul, but all manner of vows in general. But it is particularly interesting that afflicting the soul, i.e. fasting, has emphasis placed on it. And we're going to, we're going to, like we just read, every vow and every binding oath to afflict the soul. And what I'm trying to say here is that vows are vows, but there might be particular vows when it comes to just afflicting one's soul that is made by the women, okay? It's it's a distinction above the vowing vows, which may be for some other thing, right? So if we, we're finding out that if a woman vows uh, a vow to afflict her soul, her husband may establish it, he may make it void, you know, and we understand this same word afflicting is the same word we find when we're talking about atonement as it comes to fasting. So we can, you know, pretty much assume that this is the affliction you know, she, she's going to fast whether she's a woman. That also applies um, probably to the daughter as well, between her, for her father. But this is the thing that might be a little bit troubling, but it's right here in writing, so I, I can't change that. But, you know, because I have a rule in my house, you know, for uh, both my wives, Diane and Lisa, is that I've already made it known that if they're going to... Um, enter into some type of fast outside of a, you know, it, nothing to do with the vow, but I need to know first because I want to be able to judge where they are physically, where they are spiritually, uh, everything else before I commit to that. I'm just not going to, you know, and that's, but what I got going on here and what is actually being said in this verse is that uh, a woman does not have to let her husband know that she's going to take a vow to afflict her soul. She doesn't have to do that according to this Torah. And that may not be agreeable to some husbands, but the fact of the matter, it's in here and it's written. It's written in the Word. But it still applies the day the husband becomes aware of it. He can he, he, he can do an investigation, find out. Somebody else may say something to him. Somebody else, one of the other sisters or brothers. And when it comes to his hearing, that day he can go ahead and block it, right, and say no more. But the fact of the matter is, is that, yeah, lawfully, under the Word, that a woman can enter into a fast, without her husband's knowledge to afflict her soul. And, um, yeah, it's right there, and, and it just goes along with everything else that's written in this chapter. All right, verse 14, Numbers 30, verse 14. But if her husband altogether hold his peace at her from day to day, then he established all about So if he finds out, if he's aware, it comes to his attention that the, the daughter, the, the wife, has vowed a vow, and he doesn't say anything. He just lets it go from one day to the next, to the next, to the next, because the command was the day that you hear, that it comes to their knowledge, is the day that they have to make the decision whether it's going to be allowed or disannulled. So then establish about all her bonds which are upon her. He confirmeth them, meaning he makes them lawful, by not saying anything on the day you heard. He, 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 can, he makes them lawful. That, that the thing is established because he held his peace at her in the day that he heard them. Verse 15, but if he shall anyways make them void after he hath heard them, then he shall bear her iniquity. So because of the fact that he decided that, you know, he, he, she's into a vow, um, you know, say that your wife is into a vow and she's been in three weeks, right? And it comes to your attention and you let it go from, you know, and you don't... You, Obviously, she didn't. Well, she may even told you, but you just don't want to deal with it at the time. But the Bible commands that you do. So, um, the word commands that you do. So you go, you let it slip, and it goes a week, and it goes a month, and then three months down the road, you all of a sudden decide that 
you know, you don't you don't like it, you don't agree with it, and if you go back to and try to force her out of that vow after the fact, the sin that she would have received for breaking it is going to be on you. Then you're going to have to pay the penalty for not taking care of it when you should in a timely manner. That's what the law, the Torah of Yahweh, commands. So the husbands and fathers, if you hear this, and this ever becomes a situation in your house, and it comes to your knowledge, you need to deal with the day that you hear it. Whether you have to call or do whatever the case is, but under the Torah, that's what's required. can't go back later on and decide, well, all right, this is not a good thing, so I need you to stop. So it's very careful to pay attention, very careful to give heed. You know, especially, I mean, you imagine somebody in the haste, a, a woman decides she's going to make a vow, even a man, hey, I'm, I'm not... I'm not going to eat for 40 days out of some ridiculous thing, right? And and and, and this thing is binding, right? And, and you're watching them. Uh, you don't catch it. You don't say nothing right away two weeks into it or a week into it. And they're not nah, on. Then what's going to happen? You know, I can't answer all the questions, but that's, that seems to be the implication if you're following what I'm saying. That, you know, she could actually watch her, um, you know, get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and then, uh, you can force the sin upon you or by trying to stop it or what. So, yeah, there's a lot of questions I don't have answers for, but I'm just telling you what the Word says here about vows and the reason that um, you know, they're so serious. And, yeah, and they're still definitely allowable today. There, 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 there has been no change. I mean, we are in the restoration of all things. Um, you know, we are restoring the old past, and, and vows and are definitely a part, the very serious part, very serious part of our old culture. People took it uh, as serious as a heart attack, if I can use that, because they understood that this is this is a, with the Most High, right? And they understood that there was a penalty for their sin, and people held them. You know, it shows that somebody that actually um, did a vow that that was part of their character. If they were able, that showed Yah the, the honor that you have for him, the respect you have for him and his name. It shows you that you trust him when these things happen. But we're going to talk more about that, like a lot of stuff I'm bringing up now. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 21 through 23. So these three verses in Deuteronomy 23. Okay. <clears throat> When thou shalt vow a vow unto Yahweh the Elohim, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For Yahweh thy Elohim will surely require, demand it of thee. If you're going to go into it, he's going to make it, he's going to demand it of you why you didn't perform the vow. Because, and it would be sin to thee not to complete it. Don't be slack to pay it. The word pay, we're going to find out later what that means. That means to complete, I'll just tell you now. Um, I don't know why they use pay, but that's just the, the King James thing. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin. And don't be don't be compelled to vow a vow um, just because you feel a good feeling in your in your heart, or you feel like there's a reason or purpose for it, because Yah's going to require you to pay it once it comes out of your mouth. So be very careful what you're considering doing before you speak. And again, the word forbear means not to enter into it, to to just let it slide and let it just, you know, the thought go out of your mind. It would be better not to even have spoken it than spoken than have to deal with failing to perform it. Verse 23, um, okay, verse 20, If thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. That which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt keep, or thou shalt observe, or heed, or guard. Everything that comes out of your mouth, this is concerning vows. And perform means accomplish or fulfill, even a free will offering, according as thou hast vowed unto Yahweh the Elohim, which thou hast promised, which thou hast declared, pronounced, spoken with thy mouth. So again, we have something, you shall guard it, you shall heed it, you shall continue to observe it, you shall perform or accomplish it until it's fulfilled, however long that is, according to what you speak out of your own mouth, what you promised out of your own mouth, and not to do so, um, it's going to be sin and it's going to be required of thee. Um, 
All right, we here we well, okay, we're going to read an example of, of Jacob bowing to Yahweh, and he was petitioning Yahweh that in hopes that if Yahweh would hear him and meet his petition or his promise, entering into a vow that Yahweh would bless him and Yahweh would hear his petition to fulfill it. He wasn't doing a get to get type of thing. He wasn't doing a barter an agreement. That's not how these things work, right? Uh, Japhet, if you look at his story, that appears of what he did. Father, if you give me the victory, then I'll give the... No, he, he wasn't expecting to get anything. He was hoping to get the victory, and then he promised this is what he would do if he got it, but he didn't go in there with the expectation, well, hey, I'm going to make a vow to you, so I expect that you're going to fulfill it, you know? I mean, I demand that you... No, that's not how the way this, this thing rolls, if you understand. All right, Genesis 28... Verses 18 through 22, Genesis 28, 18 through 22. Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for an uphiller and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, so he spoke the vow, he vowed, meaning the action, the verb part about it. He made a proclamation, he made a declaration for a, and to, to promise Yah something. He said, Jacob vowed a vow, he spoke a promise saying, if Yahweh will be with me, and will keep me in the if, meaning if, you know, because he don't know if it's going to happen or not. He has a hope. If Yah will be with me and keep me in his this way that I go, I will I will give me bread and give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. There's a hope there that Jacob that Yah would fulfill this for Jacob. Then shall Yah will be my Elohim, and the stone which I have set for a pillar shall be Yah's house. And, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So that was the promise that um, Yahweh would always be Jacob's Elohim and that he would give a tenth or tithe. You know, they had tithing even way back then. We know that with the account of Abraham and uh, other situations where tithing was already in before it was written in the law. So um, we, have this, we have the same situation here that uh, Jacob... Yah is always going to be his Elohim, and that he will continue to tithe. That was his vow, and that, that sounds like to me, well, that was a vow for a lifetime. But Jacob knew the seriousness, and when he actually pronounced it out of his lips. All right, Psalm 76, 11. Psalm 76, 11. And it says, excuse me, vow and pay. Okay, the word pay means to be sound, to be complete, to finish. So vow and complete, vow and finish unto Yahweh your Elohim. Vow and pay, vow and finish unto Yahweh your Elohim. Let all that be around about him, uh, meaning Israel and the neighboring nations, bring presents, gifts, something you know, freely given unto him that ought to be feared, meaning Yahweh that ought to be feared because he's worthy to be um, you know, presented with gifts and stuff. But the... The real thing here is that vow and pay unto Yah. It, that's why it's to the Most High. It isn't to man or anybody else. It's to the Most High. And when you vow, whatever it may be, you vow, vow, you must complete it. You must finish it. You must be sound in um, fulfilling it and going through with the whole thing. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. Again, when when thou vowest a vow unto Yahweh, when you do this, when you're going to enter into this vow, I've made the choice and thought it over, and you're going to enter into this vow, defer, which means to delay, loiter, or procrastinate, defer not to pay it, means um, defer not to complete it, to finish it, don't procrastinate, don't loiter, don't delay, what you said, you just go ahead and make sure you're serious about it and get it done and get it taken care of. Don't drag it out. You have to make a completion to this vow. For he hath no pleasure 
in fools. So people that are considered fools are those that actually enter into a vow when you finally do, when they finally do, and then they, they do delay it, they do procrastinate, they do loiter, they do delay the fulfillment of the vow, the promise they made to Yahweh, because you're making a promise to the creator of all things. And they don't intend on completing it, they don't intend on paying for it or paying it off or finishing it, then Yahweh is going to have no no pleasure, no delight in people. And he regards these certain type of people as fools, stupid, arrogant, brutish. And in many cases, you'll find out fools are directly attributed to the wicked. Pay, that means complete, finish, make good that which thou hast vowed. Verse 5, but it is better that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. It sounds might very much like Deuteronomy 23 that we just read. So Solomon clearly he is reflecting out of the out of, of the command that was already written in Deuteronomy um, chapter 23. If we commit to doing something in the name of Yahweh and fail in that commitment, we sin before Him and are guilty of trespassing His commandment. When entering into a vow, we must have the soberness and the seriousness to understand that those things which we have freely committed to Yahweh must be completed and made good on. Okay, verse 6. Suffer not thy mouth, where suffer means allow not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. And you know that whatever man speaketh from his, through his mouth come from his heart. So be sure when you enter in what it is that if you ever do, what it is that you be a complete surety that um, you're ready to face this and ready to perform it and go through with it. Suffer not them out to cause thy flesh to sin, and neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. There's no excuse making. You can't blame anybody else for failure or putting this in you or making your lips move other than you. There's nothing in heaven and earth that you can point the finger at, just you. Wherefore should Yah be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? There's judgment for this. There's payment for not finishing up or fail, or for failure to perform the promise that you made the Most High. Here again, it's, we see why it's, it's so important to have great sobriety and self-awareness when deciding to enter into a vow before the Most High. There is no one to blame in heaven or on earth for bad decisions and hastiness. All right, we got to cover First Samuel and then the situation with Hannah, and I know the hour is working up on us, and... But there's something very incredible about this whole thing that when I was, I've read it how many times in the past, and when I read it again this time and, and being involved in this study, it just kind of shook me. It's like, wow. And it really pulled in, pulled into my mind and grabbed me, you know, by the, by the shirt and said, this stuff is damn serious. I mean, it is, it is so, in our culture, the way it was to perform these vows was, uh, th this was a, a major deal, right? I mean, a seriousness that you don't find today uh, at all, because it was a different mindset with uh, with our ancestors. All right, First Samuel chapter one, verses four, and all the way up to seventeen, four, four through seventeen. First Samuel one, four through seventeen. Okay, and when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penanai his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. So she had sons and daughters, Elkanah had sons and daughters by Penaniah. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but Yahweh had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because Yahweh had shut up her womb. You know, it says her adversary, but it never says it's Penaniah, which I always thought was interesting, but we always assumed it was her sister wife um, because she had children and Hannah didn't. And so he did so year by year, and when she went up to the house of Yahweh, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. So there's always a constant reminder, whoever this adversary was, if it was Penaniah, that um, Yahweh had shut up her womb, uh, you talk about something cruel and trying to get um, a rule over by somebody like demeaning them and beating them and, and, and reminding them of, of stuff that you have and they don't. You know, that, I mean, that's cruel and unusual punishment. Therefore she wept and did not eat. And then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou and why eatest thou not and why is thy heart grieved? 
Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Elkanah was fine with it, right, that she didn't have any sons for him. And he loved her greater than Penaniah, which was probably part of Penaniah's jealousy on top of that, a major factor in it. But the fact of the matter is, is he was okay with it, but she was not because it was it was a reproach not to be able to bear children. And they, they always looked to the Most High as the reason for their barrenness. It wasn't something natural. They always thought it was something spiritual, maybe a curse or something that had come in by the way of who knows what, but or they were under a curse and not able to bear children. But that was a heavy, heavy load on, on the women then, and probably is now. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon the seat by the post of the temple of Yahweh. And she was in bitterness of soul. Man, she's been uh, abused verbally and accosted by her adversary, probably her sister wife, Pananiah. She's in constant admire that she's in reproach. Uh, and her soul is just in bitterness, right? It's in heaviness. It's in sorrow. It's in agony. And she prayed unto Yahweh and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, all right? She vowed a vow and said, O oh, Yahweh of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child. So she's petitioning specifically for a man-child. So this tells you that you can make vows specific, right? Then I will give, what you should anyway, so. Then will I give unto Yahweh all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And when I read that, for this time, like the upteen time that I've been over this story, you think about the implications today, if you move that up today, because vows are still valid and still serious and still part of the Israelite culture. But you think about the mindset of the family unit and the structure and the household from the husband through the wives. She vowed a vow. She spoke a vow unto Yahweh. She didn't go to her husband and consent him first. She did it out of the bitterness of her soul. She was at the temple, and she made a promise. If you give me a son, I will devote him as a Nazarite. She made that decision to do that, right? She she already committed her son's whole life to being a Nazarite. He didn't have a choice because he was locked in by her vow. If you can understand how powerful that is, that, that to me that's incredible. That carried a lifetime implication. Samuel couldn't get out of it because his mother locked him into it. And at some point we have to understand that now Eli, or Elkanah, if he had had come to the knowledge of it, or the awareness, he probably could have disannulled that. It wouldn't have been lawful in the sight of the Most High. But you can see that when he did come, and we hope that he did come to an awareness of it, because you know by the time he got to be a, a young man, his hair was growing longer. He had to know something was up, right? Something was going on. And he, it undoubtedly came up, but we can see, according to the word, that he never disannulled it. So he allowed it to play out. He probably thought it was a good idea, but she was able to commit this whole son's entire life, and he didn't have a choice in it. That is amazing to me. And it came to pass as she continued praying before Yahweh that Eli marked her mouth. It means her mouth was moving, she was making confession. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was, so there was no way for Eli to go run and tell Elkanah that, you know, because he didn't actually hear it. He saw her mouth moving, but Yah heard her proclamation. Yah heard her declaration, her vow that she had vowed. <clears throat> and Eli said unto her, How long will thou be drunk and put away thy wine from thee? And Hannah answered and said, No, my master, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before Yahweh. Now, Hannah was not vowing before Yahweh because she was afflicting her soul, obviously, but Hannah was vowing before Yahweh because her soul was afflicted. And her, her being in her bitterness, sour grief and heaviness, because she was barren of womb and wanting to bring forth a son. Again, we have a demonstration here that uh, you know, you've seen it in time. We may have done it in the past, right? And something we may have to go consider repent before. But when we were vowing in the past, like they do with these wedding vows, we were vowing to the Elohim of this world, not the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I don't know how much standing a, a previous vow made outside the knowledge of who the true Yah is. 
is has does it has any standing or merit, but I would go ahead and break any curses or anything or repent for it just to cover, right? I don't know the full ins and outs, but that's my own thought. But the point is that we, we had things happen in our life, I think we all have and can relate to this, that we were in peril. I mean, we were in a troubled spot. It, it, it was, uh, you know, like the whole world just crashed in and we were looking for Yah to bail us out or the God at that time. What? I don't know, maybe somebody even right now in the faith has done that. And Father, if you do this for me, or, 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 or Yahweh, or God, if you do this for me, then, you know, I'll do this. If you get me out of this kind of thing or do whatever, um, you know, then, uh, again, the expectation that he's going to get you whatever out of trouble, whatever affliction or bitterness or whatever situation is going on. But the point I'm trying to make is I don't know if Hannah had a whole lot of thought to this when she committed this vow to have her son be in the servant service of uh, of a Nazarite his entire life with no choice but to do it, right? So, again, you have to consider when you consider, when you vow, when, you can, when you're when you ready to speak, if you ever do, think very carefully because you have to think the whole thing through from the beginning to the end and what it means for you to have to carry that vow the entirety of the time. But, I, it, I mean, people that do complete it, I can see where Yah is going to honor that because he can see you as a person of integrity a person of your promise, a person, and that means a lot to the Most High. He, he knows that whom he can trust. Okay, verse 16. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. That's why out of the abundance of her heart was full of bitterness, complaint, and grief. And she says, that's what I've spoken from. That was the root. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the Yah of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. All right, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 25. We're almost done here. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 25. It is a snare to a man who devoureth, which means to speak rashly, talk wildly, just without thought, hastily. So it's a snare to a man who who devoureth or speaks rashly or talks wildly of that which is holy, and after vows to make inquiry, reflect and consider. Okay, that's what inquiry is. So what we're dealing with here is this verse is speaking to those who, after they have committed to making a vow or vows before Yahweh, and begin to second-guess themselves, not having the same assurance that what they enter, entered into was the right thing to do, simply because they jumped the gun, so to speak, and, and didn't consider where their mind and heart was. This then becomes a snare to them, as they had already entered into their obligation before Yahweh, and now have to perform it until the end or be guilty of sin. A great example of not rightly counting the costs. Job chapter 22, verses 25 through 28. Job 22, 25 through 28. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. For thou shalt have the delight in the Almighty, and shalt lift up thy face unto Yahweh. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him. So vows come in the form of portrayer and a petition. And he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay. Thou shalt finish, thou shalt complete thy vows. So whatever vows you make in prayer and petition, you have to complete and finish them. Thou shalt also decree... That means to destroy, divide, exclude, or decide a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. All right, Psalms chapter 50, verses 14 and 15. Psalms 50, verses 14 and 15. Offer unto Yahweh thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Complete your vows, perform your vows. And call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. What a, see, what a beautiful example. You give Yah thanksgiving, you're a man of your word, a woman of your word, you're a woman of your promise, you complete these vows uh, before the Most High, and when you call upon him in the day of trouble, he's going to deliver you. That's his promise. And thou shalt glorify me because you have been delivered. And the last two verses in the book of Nahum. Chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Nahum 1, 14 and 15. 
And Yahweh hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. Again, we're more, keep the feast and perform the vows. He didn't even say keep the commandments. He said keep the feast and perform thy vows. Again, this is showing how serious this is. ranks right up there with keeping the feast of the Most High. Uh, anyway, that's the conclusion of this this study. Again, as when all studies, when you're doing the word, is uh, it, it's limit uh, limitless. So uh, I could you got to go on for three or four hours, but I think you get the gist of how important and serious that if you ever consider a vow, it's an honorable thing if it's completed and pr done as promised. And um, you know, just be clear about it if you ever do decide into them. But I think this brought out a lot of things that we've never considered when it has to come with vows, vowing of vows, and those that are in our house that might do so. But I hope I hope that you were able to get something out of it, take something with you, uh, you know, something to chew on, and uh, I hope that I was clear enough to make uh, make it clear. That That is my hope every time I sit down. And honestly, my true hope is that every time I sit here and present the study that I present this word as pure and, and, and un, unadulterated as possible. It truly it is because, you know, I know that you are Yah's people and, and you deserve to hear the word as, as purely as it can come out of a man's lips, in that case being my lips. So <laughs> I, I'm just doing the best I can. But anyway, hey, bless you all. Uh, man, you know what I was thinking when I was sitting down here for blog talk? It, it feels like the feast was months ago. It's only been a few weeks, but, man, it feels like... It was months ago already. It was like, wow. It was like, man, that is so fast. Well, hey, glory to the king. Got to be looking forward to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the Passover. So bless you all. Be encouraged. Um, you know, be sober. Be looking. Uh, and Satan's ramping things up even in greater measure. Um, and he is the goes about steal, kill, and destroy. That's his whole uh, his whole motivation to destroy Israel and destroy humanity and every all of Yah's creation. And always, please pray for your leadership. You pay for the shepherd, Pastor Dow, Pastor Corey, Pastor Dan, um, all the elders, all the leadership, the deacons, the teachers, and pray for one another because we need that. That's what Jesus emphasized that so many times in the gospel. Watch under prayer. Be sober under prayer. That's the only way that we can be alert and ready when Satan um, brings the next thing down our way. So, all right, bless you all. Uh, appreciate again you all tuning in tonight. And uh, have a great week. Uh, the King is coming. Look at him looking.